Well, The Great Tit doesn't have the largest song repertoire in the world, but it's a very recognisable song. You hear the males making this, uh, it's just a, a two note up and down. The Blue Tits, um, you'll also hear their calls around this time of year. That's much more of a, um, a rattling call, which I won't attempt to imitate because it's practically impossible. We've been studying blue tits and great tits, particularly great tits, here in White and Woods for more than 60 years now. The study was started back in 1947. These birds have very short lives, so we've actually got more than 40 generations of birds. So we can, it's like studying a human population back more than a thousand years, pre-Norman conquest almost. And that really intensive work, studying individuals and tracking their lives, and where they go to, who their offspring are and all that has resulted in a study that probably means we've, we know more about this population of birds than any other population of birds in the world. When they first started out in Whiteham, they would have been uh, walking around with binoculars and hiding in bushes and spending all their time actually observing the birds, whereas now we, we are using a lot of uh, technology and doing it remotely. Behind me you can see that there's uh, one of our automated feeding stations which we collect data on or where all the birds are in the woods and who they're choosing to feed with, which we do through this pit tag technology which we can just fit into a tiny little ring on the bird's leg. It's very exciting. We use a special technique a thing called a mist net which we put up. The birds can't see that and they fly in. They very quickly can be extracted out of there by, by trained ornithologists. And Onto those birds we put two kinds of mark. We put a, a metal ring that's got an individual number, sort of like a car number plate almost. And then we put this little plastic ring that has this transponder in. And that's the thing that will be detected um, if the birds come and take food from a feeder. There's a great tit on the feeder right at the moment. It's just flown off. So that bird will have been logged on the antenna and will be able to look up that individual and know where it was hatched in the woods, who its parents were, who its great-grandparents were, and um, what its activity has been over the winter in the course of the last years. We're actually marking and tagging, can be in a good year, the order of eight or 9,000 uh, individual birds. And then of course we've got the birds that come in from outside as well, which could be a couple of thousand. So we're getting up to maybe 10,000 birds that we're trying to track and follow around the woods. Um, many of those don't live very long, of course. You know, most of them within a few weeks, they end up in someone's tummy. Um, but that's, that's natural selection of action. After I have my breakfast in the morning, my job is to cut 200 mealworms in half, which is not the most pleasant job. One of my main interests is to study individual differences in cognitive ability in great tits. So uh, I guess very much like humans, you get dim individuals and smart ones, um, but we don't actually know whether those differences have consequences for how well individuals can survive or reproduce in the wild. Um, so specifically we're measuring learning speed um, and we're doing this in the wild by putting out automated um, boxes which have uh, coloured lights on the front and birds have to learn to associate um, one of those colours with a food reward essentially. They basically are like arcade machines. They've become pretty obsessed with it to be honest. Uh, when I come to refill it they're sort of shouting at me to, to give them some food and let them get back to their flashing lights. It's generally assumed that it's, it's good to be clever, but no one really tests it, and, and that's probably because it's quite difficult to do. You have to actually measure individual differences in a cognitive trait and then follow up those individuals and see um, how well they, they reproduce and survive in the wild. So it's quite a hard thing to do, um, but in Whiteham we're very well placed to do that. When I was seven years old, I told my parents I wanted to be an ornithologist. It's when I first learned what the word ornithologist meant um, and I was always out in the local swamp with my little pair of toy binoculars looking at birds and that's never really left me. I feel very lucky to have been able to come to Oxford which is in many ways the home of ornithology to continue working with amazing wildlife. A job that gets you outdoors, keeps you fit and you get to work with animals. <laughs> what could be better?